Good afternoon, Rakesh Shah. Welcome to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Thank you. Good afternoon to you, Bill. Thanks for coming on. Um, just want to start really at the beginning, Rakesh. Um, give us an idea of your background. I know that you did civil engineering degree in India. Give us an idea of how that went and then how you progressed into ground up vertical construction. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I come from a small city of Gujarat in India. Uh, after I finished my uh, high school, I always wanted to go in the medical field, but I yeah. did not have good grades uh, as far as the science uh, to get into the real medical, mm -hmm. but I was great at the math. So I'm like, okay, construction is another industry which was booming back in that time. We talk, I'm talking about 1984. So I decided to go in a construction field and the civil engineering was very easy to get admission into. So that's where I started. I mean, like, okay, I was great at math. I never used calculator back home. I mean, wow. you know, even during my college, I never used a calculator, you know? So that definitely got me a lot of confidence that I can do good when it comes to math and budgets and all that. Yes. So I did my college in uh, 1989 uh, in a village called Vidyanagar, which is a Gujarat university. Okay. And right after the college, Actually, during the college, because financially, I was in a lot of trouble. I lost my dad when I was 14 years old. Oh. So I had no guidance, uh, which one is the right uh, career path or anything. So I was on my own. But uh, one gentleman, uh, MD Patel, who gave me a part-time job during my college. So I work every day after college and lived in a temple near the college for four years. And finish my education there. Wow. And was... really, after that, I got an opportunity to go to Africa. So we were three brothers, uh, no dad. I was a middle child, and I asked my mom that I have an opportunity to go work in Kenya. Can I go? And she's like, Well, if that's your career path, it's taking you there, go for it. You know, wow. we are here to support you. Very supportive. So, yeah. So, and thanks to my friend also, I mean, uh, I come from the community where we are always helping each other and same here, we are together, you know. So one of my friends recommended my name to uh, his cousin who had a construction company called Renocon. They still exist actually in Nairobi. Very good. And uh, I got a job opportunity, so I went there. Uh, first, like three months, I had to live with my boss in one of his uh, extra bedroom. <laughs> we had the kids, uh, we were like four people sleeping in a room, you know. And uh, I survived there for three months, then I had my own apartment. So in Africa, it was a little different than India and here. There you are taking the job from day one as a, you are the estimator, you are submitting the bid, a tender, they call it. You win the project and you go out and build on a job as a project manager. So that definitely gave me a lot of exposure, not only in the office, but out in a job on a construction field. Yeah. Another challenge came, English was my second language. And in Africa, not that everybody speak English. Okay. They speak Swahili. Yes. So I had to learn Swahili language there. So... I learned that how to communicate with people, how to instruct people what to do, how to greet them. I learned that in like first three, four months. Mm -hmm. And then I started learning more and more. So it was pretty good. Uh, and the construction there, it's more like the Europe based, like a lot of engineers and architects are from Europe. Yes. Uh, and the construction of workers who are from India and local. Okay. Like, Indian people will be project managers and super than estimator. The labor force is African force. Yeah. So and be, it was like a great, yeah, go ahead. I'd be interested to, to get your view on this because it is very different. Estimating in the US is very different to estimating in UK or Ireland or Europe. Was it like that in Africa? And give us a quick idea of the differences. I think the quantity surveying, which is what they call it in Europe, That's they have more control over the costs and over the project. Is that right? That is correct. So there, they are giving you a same book. Let's say if you have a 30,000 square feet office feet out there, they will give you all the quantities 
all the description is like a hundred pages standard book. And all you are building in there is like you are filling the unit prices for every line item. Now, if you see something on a drawing which is not listed there, you will give them a whole list of the things like, okay, this is on a drawing, but it's not on the tender book. So here are the add alternate for those. It's almost identical as what you see in the UK. Very good. Yeah. And a lot of people, I know that a lot of people, especially coming from Europe over to the US, they find it difficult adapting. Um, but when they do adapt, they, they're, they're very, very good. And I know that companies really like people that come from Europe, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, you, you name it. Um, give us an idea then, obviously you worked in Kenya, um, worked there for a little bit. How did your path or how did it come about that you ended up coming to the US? Was that always an idea or a dream of yours? No, that was not uh, in my uh, thoughts or a dream at all. So we believe in arranged marriage. Yes. And uh, so I went to India to get married where I met my wife, which is 26 and a half years ago, back in India. She lived in, thank you, she lived in US uh, probably six, seven years before we met. She came to India to get married and I came to India and one of my friends introduced me to her and we met uh, probably two weeks before we got married. And then she came back to America. Uh, I went back to Africa. She joined me in Africa. She became pregnant and like, look, I don't want my baby to be born in Africa. I want to go back to America. If you want to come there, it will be great. And that's how I met in America. Uh, I came here in 94. Brilliant. Straight to New York? Yeah. Well, New Jersey. I've New Jersey. been always living in Jersey, uh, but I work more in New York than New Jersey. Very, very good. And give me an idea of landing in, in America. How difficult was it get, getting your head around how they estimated here, but also the construction industry and getting your first role? Oh boy, <clears throat> that was another challenge. So I remember when I came here, I must have applied at least like 200 plus uh, places. <laughs> Looking at the Star Ledger, New York Times, uh, all those newspapers. Uh, back then, we had those uh, AOL uh, internet and working from the old computer, you know. And that was another thing. Computer was a challenge back then, but I invested in a computer to learn it. So I spent like $2,000 back then in 95, bought a computer. The first job I got uh, was a testing lab where I have been doing the uh, concrete test, soil testing, structure, steel inspection. But it took me about six months to get that job. So my boss is like, go get the license and then I'll hire you. I didn't have a driving license back then. When I came first time, it took me almost three months to get a license. Okay. So I've been, uh, I have worked at a grocery store. I have worked at the gas station. I have worked at the Sunel warehouse, you know. So I did all those things for first six months. But then finally, I got a break into the construction industry. I still remember I was making 8.05 per hour, uh, you know, at the U.S. testing lab. And uh, within a year and a half, my boss gave me a promotion, made me an office manager. He's like, you seems like a right fit for that. We are 30 people, but we have to send 30 people to different job sites every day. And when the call comes in sometime, hey, I got three trucks coming today. I always roll up my sleeve and I go myself and did it. So that definitely gave me a break. And that's where I really got, I'm like, okay, this is not my uh, career. I'm on a one-way street. I'm going to go keep on going, keep on going. I don't want to look back. So I got connected with one of the project manager at a job site. I was building the train station in Hamilton, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And he helped me to build my resume. Very good. And one thing I did is, and I always tell people, you got to get out of the trailer or the office if you want to learn construction. You cannot be sitting in the office and doing the budget. Even if you are an estimator, you got to be out on a job site. See how they are building things you are budgeting. Yeah. And that's what I did. I started learning how they install everything, how the fabrication happen, how they get delivered, uh, you know, on a job. And that, helped me and I got my first break at the Metalpine construction, I would say about 97. Yeah. And he had a project in New Jersey. He wanted a site superintendent. I'm like, I, I can definitely do it. 
I met with him and then I still remember he made a comment like your English is not that great uh, as it's a second language you have accent and this and that and I say Bob I know how to build things if yeah. I cannot speak and sew them I will roll my sleeves and sew them how to install it mm -hmm. and he liked it he hired me as a super I worked with him for about three years so that got me into the site superintendent and a project manager role. Yeah, and that's and that spe speaking with um, estimators, the best estimators right now that I'm speaking with all started on the field, whether it be on the labor, on the tools, or as a superintendent or as an APM um, project engineer. That is the most vital experience. Everybody, all my clients would tell, tell, tell me that. They said, don't be, yeah. send, don't be sending me an estimator that has never worked in the field. Right, exactly. It, it makes a big difference when you are speaking about any of the budget you have prepared. If you cannot explain somebody why is the value you are saying is the actual value, if you know how that value occur, you can mm -hmm. explain them easy. And, and that was the biggest thing. Like the reason I am successful as an estimator, I take a pride at myself. Like I'm one of the best estimator. I'm sure there are a million of them out there. Uh, a lot of them are great. And I'm one of them. But because, as you say, people started in the field and became an estimator, and that, that's what happened. Uh, so after that, I got a break at Turner Construction in New York. Very good. That was my real construction job for the Turner in 98. So when they hire me, Turner does a great thing. It's the best school. I tell people, like, if you don't go to college for four years, if you work for Turner for two or three years, you yeah. are graduated in construction. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the best school. I went there as an estimator and they put me in a group. Now I already had a skill how to do the things, but I never did the budget for work in America. So it's way different than what we do in India. We yeah. do everything differently there than here. So and I learn a lot. Were you given when you went into Turner uh, as a, you, you essentially went in as a field guy to an estimating team with no experience of estimating in the US. So were you given a mentor or a training or a development program that you had to stick to? Or was it just a case of here's the estimating team into the deep end, learn as you go? No. So they, they, they did very nicely. So when they have anybody, actually, even myself, Let's say if I'm with Turner for three years, and if there is a project comes in, you are not the uh, individual working on that budget or anything. You have a team of four or five estimators to work on that project. So they have one lead estimator and three or four helping them. So that, that's what I did for like first few months. I was always helping somebody on a project. Yeah. When I was ready, they gave me one project. Like here, you are the lead on this. Now somebody who was late before will be under you on this project. Yeah, yeah. So they give you that opportunity and drop you in. And Rakesh, how long did it take you to get up to speed with all the divisions estimating across the, the whole gamut, so lead projects? I would say it took me almost about an year. Uh, by the time I won like a $40 million lump sum bid, and wow. that time Peter Devran came and uh, like gave me a like, tap on my shoulder, like, good job. <laughs> So it, it was a proud moment for me. And, and let's be honest, Rakesh, it's very, very rare that we as, a, or as estimators, you get a tap on the shoulder or a pat on the back because we're, we're, uh, we're either high and, and lose a job or we're low and uh, we've forgotten something. True. I mean, I, I got yelled by one of the president, like I missed some fire action, you sir. And <laughs> it was like $600 change order. I'm like, hey, happens, you know? Like, <laughs> exactly. not allowed in my world, you know? <laughs> Um, so that brings me to my next question. Um, after Turner, I think you went to Structure Tone for 10 years and yeah. most recently we work. Give me an idea of how your career went from a part of a team at Turner to being leading an international uh, company like we work. Sure. So when 9-11 happened, Turner has this uh, rotational program, they call it they send you out in a field to become a project manager to grow in the company. Mm -hmm. If I'm an estimator and only doing estimating, I cannot grow in the company. So they asked me to go and re, uh, do the uh, assistant project manager role at uh, 90 Church, which was damaged by one of the uh, uh, airplane crash in 9-11. Uh, 
So I work on that job for about six months, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of nights and a weekend. And uh, that time my daughter was very young. Uh, I had a young kid back then. Uh, she was about, I would say, six year old. Mm -hmm. So I chose to go back to estimating and I started looking and I saw an opportunity at Structure to New York office. And when I applied, they said, well, we have a job in Jersey if you are interested. And that's how I got uh, at Structure Tone. Very good. And that was a great opportunity. I, Structure Tone played a big role for me to grow in this world. Good, good. They looked after you. And what was it about Structure Tone? Was it the training that you got there? Was it the, the aut autonomy? Was it the, the team that you were involved in? It was, was it one particular manager or mentor that... that, that Absolutely, and I will always say uh, this one guy, uh, Son Galvin, uh, who was at Structure Tone uh, for uh, about 25 years. He left them about five, seven years ago and went to Holt, but he was my mentor. Good. But when I joined Structure Tone, they dropped like $20 million job on my desk and say, here, go deal with it. Deep end. And if Son was not there, I would have some challenges. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and what do you think is the most difficult part of being an estimator? I think we talked about it previously in another call. Estimating is a difficult, difficult job. Uh, we don't get the recognition. Our estimators and pre-construction professionals do not get the recognition that they deserve. Um, it's usually the project managers, the superintendents that are there at the end and at the beginning cutting the ribbon. Um, how important yeah. is the pre-construction and estimating side of, of, of commercial construction? So that's something I really, uh, in, uh, I would say I uh, made a big impact at Structure Tone. Uh, and uh, Structure Tone was always like treat you as a family. And if you come up with the idea, they love it. So, you know, nine out of 10 times you go for the interview, like the presentation for the pre con to win the job. They bring the super, they bring the schedule, they bring the PM, the vice president, the president of the company and the head of the department. Here are the six, seven people in a suit. We're going to go build your job. I brought it to like, bring the estimators, let the client see who is managing their money. Okay. And I did that for a couple of presentations and the client loved it. They're like, yep, that's a man I want to deal with because they have procurement department. And the bigger challenge is architects and the engineers. Okay. If they do the right due diligence, there are less of the change orders. Because mm -hmm. that's where you lose the relation and a trust between the GCs and a client. They will always go to estimator like, yep, you messed up the budget. You didn't do the right budget. You are carrying something in the budget. When the design comes, they want to build Taj Mahal. So <laughs> if they understand the concept like design to the budget, I always bring this up. I'm a big fan of design to budget. If you have $200 in your pocket, you can only buy something for $200 or less. Mm -hmm. You cannot look on the shelf, which is a $300 or $400. Okay. A lot of architects has all these designers who do not have a skill to know the prices. They mm -hmm. go by the distributor's price. Distributors say, yeah, this marble is $40 per square feet. But they don't know by the time that stone get delivered to that job, it's $100 per square feet stone. Uh, so okay. those are the bigger challenges we find in a finances. No matter what we do, there is always a budget bust between the original budget to the final series. And then we have to value engineer the job and then the schedule get delayed or the client has to go get more money. Yeah. And they get a red eye to the estimator. So it's a big challenge. I mean, have I won always? No, I would say maybe one out of 10 times I've, like, I've been to my budget and yeah, zero problem. Normally, the always a change order. I have not done a single job without a change order. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that you're a big believer in getting the capex of the client and and budgeting to that. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it makes everybody's life much easy. You know, yeah. when you know what client want. Do you find that that clients that's the way that they like to work, or are they more on a on a give you like a, a range or would you prefer it's 150 dollars per square foot or whatever it may be that's what we're going with for a fit out or do you and then they walk through it and they say no i want that change to a, a nicer marble or whatever it may be how annoying is that and is it okay to do that once the client changes it or do you prefer to get a capex at the beginning 
Yeah, so we, I, I would love to have the CapEx knowledge and the contingency they are carrying that helps them also. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the project, if they have money left over, they can use like, I, I, I give an example. We had a project in New Jersey was a hotel project and the client had $20 million. Mm -hmm. And the first budget came at $24 million. So we value engineered the job. Now we got, we brought the budget down to $20 million. Great, let's go and bid it. Now we did better buyout on certain trades. So then I went back to the client and say, hey, remember we remove all the wall panels, wood panel from the column. We have extra $60,000. I can give those panels back. Do you want it? They're like, yeah, we'd love to have them. So you rather bring the budget to the CapEx and you work towards that and save the money, do the better buy and do the share saving. Like do the GMP and say, hey, Mr. Client, if I save you $100,000, so give me 60% and you take the 40 or two third and one third, whatever works out. But with that money, we can also put back some of the things you always wanted. And we work. We move around the bucket sometimes, you know, like give yeah. up something and we'll give you that. Yeah. yeah. And then after Structure Tone, you went to WeWork, you were headhunted to WeWork. Um, how enjoyable was that job? I think the reason that, that, that they selected you in the end up was your international experience. Because tell me a little, about, a little bit about the WeWork job and how difficult it was. It wasn't just your traditional GC. It was on the client side and it was multiple fit outs across the world. Yes. So it was very exciting actually. Uh, so I would go back a little bit. Before, after Structure Tone, I was at M. Moser okay. doing a design build for about three years. So that gave me a lot of exposure to Asia market, Europe market, West Coast and Tri-State. And then when I got a call from somebody at WeWork, like, hey, come and meet with us. That time they had nobody in the office doing estimating. There were about 200 and no, 600 people back then, I think. And they said, we want somebody to lead the estimating group and build a team so we can save the money. And I still remember, I will not curse, but the way Adam Newman talked to me, he brought me in his office, the, you know, the co-founder of the company and said, these guys are spending a lot of my money. I wanted to bring the CapEx down by 30%. And I said, done deal, we'll work on it. Mm -hmm. So there were so many open end. Uh, of course, we had a lot of uh, genius people in the company. Uh, we had a great uh, money power, the buying power. We had a great pipeline. So that wasn't an issue. So we started making uh, volume deals. Like, okay, we'll buy 100,000 light fixture from China and we manufacture our own, rather than every time there is a project, we are going to a GC and asking him to buy light fixture. Okay. That brought down the cost of light fixture from $350 to $55. Wow. You know, so it was a huge impact on that. So we started making those kind of a deal. Like we had the one wood flooring guy. I say, okay, if I give you a million square feet in one year, what's the price per square feet, whether it's in Vegas or West Coast or East Coast, you know, and it's like, okay, I'll install it for $3 for you anywhere you send me. Rather than me paying 5 and $7 to local guys there, we got this guy travel all over the US. So that was one challenge I started working on and then building the team because there was nobody else there except myself. Yeah. So I started hiring people. I had a couple local guys hired, started hiring people in the West Coast, India, China, London, and now, okay, we are controlling some of the key product. We still have designers who are designing what they want to design. So there are days like we have wallpaper comes like $10 per square feet. Some wallpaper is $2 per square feet. So I started training the designers. Like before you put anything on the spec, come and talk to our team. We'll help you to choose the right product which fits our CapEx. We worked on that. Now, same time, selecting the GC, there was a time before I started, like the PM will hire any GC out of the street and say, okay, go and do my job. Yeah. Give me the price, yeah. go build the job. We set up the RFP system, interviewing the GC, like who is the right GC, who is the reputed GC, who are the right fit for the size of the job. And then we started making multiple project deal, like, okay, we have three projects in dollars. I'll give you all three projects. Give me square feet, uh, per square feet number. They are all mm -hmm. same. Mm -hmm. You may have different colors, different color paint, different color countertop. So we started working. We're, 
we I, I always call ourselves like we are the Starbucks rollout. You know, yeah. they are yeah. all Starbucks. Yeah. Maybe you have green marble or white. Yeah, but but was it was it the Starbucks model before you got involved, or was it different? Yeah. For for every yeah. So you you, yeah. you were you were the person that, that brought that on board, and that was yeah. purely for a cost saving. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. yeah. We, we made uh, so many of those. Uh, uh, I would call it the supply chain deals. Yeah. With those kind of, like all that material, the wallpaper, the millwork, wood flooring, installation on the drywall. You know, we started making those deals, mm -hmm. and people like we. My four-year career there. I have seen so many people grow from five people company to like hundred people company, two hundred people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the beauty of it, and that, I mean that's the model that 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 Adam Newman yeah. went for, and with that particular role, what was the most difficult thing? Um, because as the first guy on on the floor, did you have to sell a lot of the ideas to Adam himself or to the designer team? Did you get buy-in right away, or or was it quite difficult? It was it was difficult. Uh, the reason behind it, I'm not going to blame anybody, but the model we work had was like, go, 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 get it, build it. I don't mm -hmm. care how you build it. So what happens is when you're giving somebody an open checkbook and say, go deliver the job, they're going to spend all the money they can to make themselves look like a hero. Yeah. Yes, I opened the building on a January 1. The thought behind that was like, okay, when we work is opening on January 1, that means they are opening January 1. There are members lined up to get in a building at eight o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So they never wanted to miss the deadline. Okay. So whatever it takes, they will build it. Yeah. But there are ways to do the same thing. Like we build the right partnership with the people and we deliver. Yeah. But PMs were concerned and they were always like giving me a hard time. Yeah. But again, if, if and that's all well and good if that is the model, but to be smart about it, scheduling, logistics, preparation, that can all happen, but it, it just needs to happen in, in a more coordinated way, which obviously you were in charge of. And how did it work keeping the culture and the consistency across different locations across the world? How difficult was that? There were two parts of it. One was the... Uh... I would not discriminate by saying any word, but uh, I, I felt like I was more senior when it comes to the age and dealing with young project managers and designers. So there was challenges. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was ready to give up the job within one year. Yeah. Like I can't deal with this. Yeah. But then I changed myself. I'm like, listen, they're not going to change. Maybe mm -hmm. I have to change my culture. I came from traditional world, from Turner and Structure Tone. And this was like whole different world. So I started change and learn from them. I started learning from them and we become the best friend to deliver. Yeah. So there were those challenges. And as far as the outside New York, I mean, I've been doing projects in Mexico. I've been doing project in Canada, uh, India, China. Uh, I've actually, I went to Shanghai a couple of times and it's a different market. Uh, so, the best way I would say I learned the estimating and, and we, we were gave me a great opportunity to know more about the different world market, you know? Yeah, of course. So, and I learned more from people who I build a network with. Yeah. I, I had a lot of people through my LinkedIn connection, whether I know them personally or I've been connected. So I took the advantage of the networking and connected with people like, hey, I have a job in London. Uh, can you help me with the budget? Now I have one budget, now I'm learning their market. Yeah. Then some of the market, I'll say, okay, San Francisco and New York. Okay, same budget. Maybe it's a little more on electrical side because of their local code, but everything else almost identical. So that's how I started learning the market. And I remember like one of my uh, senior will come to me. Okay, see, I have a job in uh, uh, Brazil. I needed to get me the budget within two hours. Yeah. I will go online, I will look at the labor rates and I'm like, okay, I'm paying $120 per carpenter for one hour here. There, they are making $8 per hour. So the labor is a 60% on a carpentry. The material is a material, you know. Yeah. yeah. So that's how I started learning it. Yeah. Very good. Um, and you mentioned, I really like what you said there about you actually adapted to the younger generation. Give me an idea of, of what, what, uh, 
what, what what's expected uh, of these guys now? Because I do get it all the time. Um, there is a, a, a head body. I'm trying to get to, to tell people and companies advise them. There's a reverse mentoring that could happen here. The young people can teach the, the older guys and the older girls the technology side of it, the VD side side of it, and in turn, the, the real tricks of the trade that you guys have learned throughout your career and on site can be taught to the younger guys and girls. So me changing myself and uh, working with them was like a few different ways I started working. Like first, I started giving them the respect that everybody else deserves. Okay. I, I didn't want them to think like, yeah, this guy been in a construction for 20 years and he think I don't know. And that's why he's treating me like that. So I changed that attitude. I'm yeah. like, guys, we are same team. We are yeah. working for the same company. And if we work together, we are all going to look like a hero. So they started trusting me like, okay, this guy is not here to hurt me. Good. And I started giving them the compliments like, you guys are doing great. What you are doing is, but if you add a little bit of this and that, it will make you look successful. I've been out there long enough. If I lose my job, I'm going to find another job. But yeah. for you to grow, I think you should take some of this advantage from me and use my experience and expertise and add it in. And of course, you will find one in a ten that who still doesn't like your idea. That time you let them speak up their idea and accept what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they learn it hard way. Like, you know what, like I should have listened to you. I have mm -hmm. people came to me in like that after six months. If I listened to you six months ago, I didn't. I could not have spent like extra hundred grand, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, I like that. Um, now, give me an idea, Rakesh. What is the what is the most most different or difficult thing, or what what is the the, the most amazing design or, that you've ever been given um, or asked to kind of put into a project? Is there anything that stands out as a highlight? Oh yeah. Uh... And I, that goes back to Turner days. So right after 9-11, CNN lost their tower okay. from the World Trade Center. So Turner Properties made a call to Turner Construction and says, can you guys meet us on a, one of the building on a 6th Avenue right across from Radio City? We want to bring our studio there. So we went there. Myself, my boss, a uh, couple of engineers from my office, and some PMs. They wanted the whole team to see the budget, if it's doable, and if you can design a studio there. So there was a column in the middle of the studio. Uh, actually, the place is still there, but they removed the uh, studio sign now. And they said, we want to remove this column, but there were eight floors above <laughs> in the building. And the column was right in the middle. So... People were scratching heads like, you got to be kidding me. So, but my background is also civil engineering. So we learned structural design in our education. And I'm like, nope, we can do it. And they're like, you are an estimator. How do you know it? I'm like, we can do it. Very good. I contacted Narendra Chabra, uh, one of the engineer, and brought them in. And they say, yep, we can do it. We put transfer girder in the basement was about five feet tall across two columns on a side and then we are monitoring every deflection in a building like even if it deflect tiny hair they will not do it we monitor for like three weeks we remove the column and everybody was happy so wow. that was the biggest challenge project i have ever worked on very nice very good and another question i always asked um someone of your experience if you were to go back now even in the time in, in kenya what advice would you give your younger self? 10 years back in my life? Yeah. 10 years back in my life, I always wanted to grow into the field, but be a kingmaker. I never wanted to be a king. Okay. I always love mentoring people. I love helping people create the leaders. I always believe in that, that if you work for me, and if you do something, I'm not the person who will say, oh, I did it, it's my group. I'll yeah. always say, you did that, give him the compliment. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, as I said, I wanted to be a kingmaker. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I have so many people 
went through me i trained so many young kids estimators uh in my life good good and what's the 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 importance of technology we're also we're all seeing the importance of technology and collaborating and, and staying and communicating and, and staying in touch with each other right now but within pre-construction how important is technology and where do you see it going in the next 10 15 years uh, it's taking away a lot of uh, hard work from uh, people who has to physically do things like for example 3d scan the laser scans there was a time that we had to go physically and work the entire job before the pre-construction budget to make sure we pick up all the uh, existing conditions. So these days the technologies are great. You can do a 360 view of the space. You don't even need to go out. I have used those technologies on a lot of my projects that I don't need to go to West Coast and walk the building yeah. while I can see on a camera. Mm -hmm. So it's a great tool. I love it. Uh, I'm sure there are so many new softwares and things are coming out. It's great, but I still believe I'm an old school that certain things you have to physically monitor. Don't rely on technology only. Yeah. What, what sort of things? And like this uh, existing condition, for example, like what you can see on a that small screen for 360. Mm -hmm. If I go there and physically walk around, I know what's involved to bring that existing building to a usable space. Yeah. Yeah. Photograph is this technology does not give you enough information. Yeah. It's great for the dimensions and uh, heights and all that, like to build the as builds out of it. The Revit models are a great tool for estimating. I love it. You know, it saves you a lot of time. When you have less time to budget, it pulls up a lot of quantities. Mm -hmm. So it's good technology to have, but still, I believe that you have to personally uh, be involved in that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And um, I agree with you the whole walkthrough. You've got to see, I think one of the first things, and a lot of estimators say this, to walk the site of the project and to get a look at it is the most important part of it. Um, once you do that, whether you take pictures yourself or you get a drone to take a pictures, they're still important. But being physically there, it's so important because you, you're, fine, you're, you're looking to see about the landscape, maybe the weather, the climate, there could be there could be certain things that'll change the price that you you'll never know unless you're on site. There is one word I want to add to it uh, to my estimating skill actually I uh, and it's uh, a really a quote or a key word I would say for myself. I used to tell people when I teach them estimating, nine out of ten times when you get the drawings, estimators, the PMs, and the supers they look at the drawing. Did they go through all the drawing? Yep, I looked at it. I don't look at them. I read the drawing. That's what I tell people. Yeah. You have to read it. If it's a floor plan, you got to put yourself into that floor plan and see where you are starting walking around on the paper and learn the project, not just like reading through, you know, it makes a yeah. big difference. Yeah, of course. Very good. Um, and that's, that's actually good advice for, for junior estimators because that's the people that's going to be listening to this and, and, and learning from this and getting the value out of this. Um, is, there anything, is there anything else that you would advise young estimators or people getting into estimating? What would you say is, is the key things that they should be doing to make sure that they're, they're of a high level? So I would definitely ask them to make sure they're accurate on the quantities. Do not, trust, do not trust yourself on all the unit prices you're plugging in. It always helps for somebody to go through them. Don't just give them an estimate because that's what happened. They rush the numbers, they plug in the number from one job to the other job. They do not realize like a job on a sixth avenue in New York could be different than a job downtown. Depend on the schedule, when you are doing the job, how the deliveries are. So I always tell people, make sure you take an advice from your senior estimator who you are working with and have them read through the budget and understand the values you are plugging in. Takeoff, I trust them. They are great actually at doing the takeoffs and all that. Unit prices and all that, it takes a while for every estimator to learn. It took me a long time yeah. to become a unit price uh, expert, you know. Good. That's good advice. Appreciate that. So tell me, Rakesh, uh, you're in your, uh, as you say, your man cave in New Jersey. What do you do to uh, get away and get it, release the frustrations of estimating and pre-construction? What do you do to get it unwind? There, 
Well, so there are a few things I do during this quarantine, but uh, uh, when it's a perfect world out there, I go to a lot of football games. Uh, I'm a New York Giant fan. Very nice. My whole basement is New York Giant. Uh, I mean, I'll show you on the camera after the recording is done, but I'm a huge Giant fan. I go to every single game in New Jersey. Very good. Uh, I have a great uh, big group, about 100 some people. We do tailgate parties. Wow. Yeah, so that's uh, one of my biggest. And in quarantine, I enjoy cooking. Uh, so I cook every other day. Uh, I come down in my basement, uh, I do karaoke. What's the go-to song? Uh, <laughs> most of them are Indian music, so uh, I, I cannot, sing Engli- uh, cannot sing English music. Very good. But uh, most of my music is from India, which is a classical and a jazz kind of music. Good man, yeah. good man. I like it. Uh, well, listen, this has been great. Just give us a quick um, update now because I know that uh, we work have let go most of the estimating team and unfortunately you were one of those people. Give me an idea of what you're looking for now. What's the ideal role for Rakesh Shah over the next three or four months? What are you looking for? So I will be looking to uh, work for somebody like WeWork, not exactly the same business. It could be Yahoo, Google, Amazon, anybody. But I want to go and help those clients who has a lot of real estate, help them to trim down their capex, show them the ways to save the money on a project without giving up any of the design. Okay. That, that's my goal. Uh, so I definitely want to go back and work for the clients okay. who has a lot of real estate. Good. Good. So Rakesh Shah is going to save the client money. That's what we want to hear. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. I, say, I call myself an estimating guru. And there's only one Rakesh out there. So. <laughs> get, get him while he's available. <laughs> yeah. Good man. Thank you very much, Rakesh. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm hoping that the, the audience will get some value from that, especially the young estimators. And we look forward to seeing you on the client side very soon. Excellent, God. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you are doing this with me. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation and stay safe. Uh, we'll be coming out strong. Stay, stay safe, Rakesh. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.